here in the front because we're, again, two teams and we wanted everyone to see the banner as well as the car that we're about to present. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. We are Team 11. We're presenting to you the Shelly Eagle Marathon electric prototype vehicle. Team 11 consists of Curtis Francis, Rodrigo Cabrera, and myself, Lawrence Sinolovsky. The Shell Eagle Marathon is a competition that happens every year in Europe, Asia, and the Americas. This year, the competition occurred in Detroit, Michigan for the Americas. Over 1,000 students attended, and the category in which we competed was the electric vehicle prototype. The problem statement. The problem statement was to design and build a vehicle that could travel the farthest distance with the least amount of consumption possible. Division of Responsibilities. I myself worked on the energy source, Curtis worked on the steering system, and Rodrigo worked on the hub, the wheels, and the rims. This is the Gantt chart. At the beginning of the semester, we did most of the design in the building, and then towards the end, we did the testing, the evaluation, and everything else. The energy source that we used in this car was a lithium ion nickel cobalt manganese battery. This is the battery itself. It's rated for 36 volts with 20 amp hours, and it can produce about, or it can sustain 800, a life cycle of 800, as well as a rated average of about 720 watts. The reason why we chose this battery is because of the following calculations. We did the sum of forces. First we did the rolling resistance, we followed by the drag force, as well as Newton's second law, F equals MA, and the sum of these forces times our average speed gave us the power needed to move this vehicle, which was about 592 watts down here. But to, fur to further validate these results, we went ahead and we made a simulation on MATLAB. The MATLAB simulation shows the lithium battery, the DC hub motor, and the wheel and axle. But to make it more real and lifelike, we also added some dampers, rotational damper and inertia. However, the most important parts of this simulation were really the voltage and the current. And down here, we also added angular velocity and displacement, just for further purposes. In the next slide, you can see the current itself. It starts at 14, dips down, and then comes back up and stabilizes at 15. And in the next slide, we can see the voltage which starts at 30, goes up to almost 35, and then stabilizes again. The combination of the current and the voltage gives us a power consumption of about 530. So as we can see with the energy from the battery that we have, which is rated at 720, it's more than enough. Most of the professors recommend to have at least 10 to 15, max 20% more, because at the beginning, the car will consume more energy when it's starting from zero. The technical inspections. In the technical inspections, the judges came ahead and came to the back of the vehicle, they lifted this part and checked all the electrical systems. They, there's two manual override switches, one in the back and one in the steering wheel. The manual override switches are used to cut off the energy from the battery in case of an emergency and also for consumption. So what the judges did was, they had our driver, Cynthia, go ahead and throttle while they were raising the back of the vehicle, then cut off the circuit to make sure that they worked. And we passed both inspections. Here is the competition results. In the results, they use a joule meter which is connected right here. It's connected in between the controller as well as the battery. It measures the joules, the watts per second during competition. And as you can see, all trials were competed. The first trial, we went a little bit over. We went two minutes over. But our consumption was about 400,000 joules. We dropped it down 100,000 joules the second trial because Cynthia started using the manual override as she got more used to the car. And then unfortunately in our last trial, the judges did not turn on our joule meter, so we assumed the value of about 200,000 joules, which would have given us 180 kilometers per kilowatt hour, which is the units that they use in the competition to verify your results. Can I pass on the mic to this? Good afternoon. For the steering system, we considered using the increments principle simply because we want to keep a common pivot point and also decrease the tire slippage within the tires in our design. <clears throat> Here we have the track that we competed on in Detroit, Michigan. This track length is about 0.9 miles and each trial was about 6.3 miles. And in, in each trial we did, which was three, 
we um, had no any no fails, no failures at all, and we competed successfully. Next, we used the design of the four linkage bar system simply because it, it's a simple setup and not much components were needed, and we were able to figure out the angles we needed to go, to be able to maneuver in the in the turning radius of eight meters. The criteria for the competition were having the wheelbase more than 50 centimeters and also for the track, which is the width, um, more than um, 100 centimeters. Um, the major portion for the steering system was to keep the turning radius within the eight, meter, eight meters. Here are some sample calculations. Based on these equations, we were able to determine what angle we needed to perform and um, implement into the system. Here are the numbers we used from the, the rule book with one of the minimum values, and we got this steering angle. Here, another thing we, um, we did was a static analysis, which was on the, both the wheel hub and the spindle. And in this picture, it shows the mounting of the spindle on the seat bracket, and also the force applied on the wheel hub. The stress applied was 700 newtons, which, which was the total weight of the car, and also the max, maximum stress was 164 megapascals. The parts used were from a go-kart website we um, found on, a, on the internet, and we're able to use those specifications and apply it to the system. Our final assembly, were, which is here, and as you can see beforehand, we customized the steering wheel for the specification of our driver, and we were able to compete and she um, performed well in, um, in the time of exit test. And also in the uh, um, inspection, we were able to tackle this with no problem on the first round. And also for the dimensions, we were within the dimensions of the 100 and, and uh, 50 centimeters for the vehicle, which were the minimum standards we needed to, the, which was the maximum standards we needed to overcome. For the brakes and rims, uh, first I want to go the brakes. Uh, we used hydraulic brakes. Why? Because instead of disc brakes, they're a closed system. It means that the fluid will push the pad, as you can see here, will push the pad against the disc, and that's how it breaks. In disc brakes, you actually have a cable pulling it. That means that, and we use that just because of the fact that it's a car, it's not a bicycle. And that means if the disc brake would, would, would have been placed, the calibration would have been a lot more. We could, we should have, uh, we, would have needed to calibrate every single run instead of just putting it on the, on the car and leaving it the whole way through. The wheels and rims, we used standard uh, bicycle rims because it was easier for us and it was uh, the best that we can find. Uh, it was a 26 two front wheel that you can see here and a 20 inch wheel on the back attached to the brushless hub motor. That means that uh, the wheel on the back all came with the hub motor by itself so we didn't have to buy or attach it or uh, buy a new one from scratch. The design, before the door analysis and actually implemented in the car, we designed everything in SOLIDWORKS to see if it will fail or not, uh, to do a simulation. In the simulation, we did a thermal simulation uh, resembling the pads against the disc, and the highest, thermal, uh, highest temperature we got is 365 Kelvin, and the highest flux simulation is, is 2.84 uh, times 10 to the 9. Uh, that means the failure uh, will never happen. Even though it gets hot, uh, the pads, that's the worst case scenario that for, for our system, so it will be more than enough. For the analysis, uh, at, uh, we did analysis also of braking force. At a maximum velocity of 6.71 meters per second, which is 15 miles per hour, uh, and to stop the car in three seconds, you need 112.2 newtons. And this chart uh, will tell you a lot of different velocities, how much force do you need. It, it, it goes up exponentially because of the fact the more the faster you go, the, the more force you need to break the, the whole car. The manufacturing, and that was a tricky one because they're bicycle, uh, they're bicycle brakes and they're not car brakes or something that we can just put in the car. We have to manufacture most of the stuff. Uh, the two handles on the front mean that uh, each handle uh, brake the right and the, the, the front right and the left right of the braking of the car. Uh, we have to attach them and hold them together. That way, when you when you uh, press the lever, you break both at the same time instead of one each at the same time. And that was one one part of the requirements that we have to overcome through this whole process. Uh, the back the back the pedal uh, really uh, turns on the the back brake, which creates the as you can see here uh, the the pass to against the disc. The brake attachment uh, is kind of tricky because 
because a spindle is not a manufacturer for a, the brakes are not manufactured for a car, but for a bicycle, as I said before. We had to uh, weld two, uh, two steel uh, uh, plates against each other and put, different, uh, 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 put a lot of washes into it so the pads don't touch the, brake, the brakes while going in the curse. That way we don't lose energy and your friction and the, the, the resistance is not, it's not a lot. Uh, and for the, for the back brake, we manufactured a structure for the motor and we, did, we drilled into the structure to find the perfect placement of the, of the back brake that way it worked fine. That way the pads don't touch the, the disc uh, as well. The inspection braking test. The inspection was the most important for us because of the fact that we, we, did, we did not only did in technical inspection, we had to pass it every single time we had to uh, go and make a run. Every time we went in a race, we had to pass the inspection. It's a 25 degree ramp, and what they do, they put the car in a 25 degree slope. Uh, they, you have all three brakes at the same time, then they tell you release the back brake and you only have the two front brakes. Then they tell you the same thing for the back brake. The tricky part was uh, for, uh, for the front brake, we have two brakes, and for the back one, we have one. Uh, so we uh, were concerned about the back brake uh, uh, not passing inspection, but every single time it passed, just because of the fact that it was the placement that we did, the washers, and how the pads were uh, implemented in the car. Good afternoon, we are team number 12, and we are the other group that working on this project to compete on the Shelly Command. We are composed by Javier Gutierrez, Mahim Perez, and myself, Luis Mesa. Uh, the responsibility for this group were divided like this. Javier Gutierrez was in charge of the power train and the energy management. Uh, I was in charge of the bodywork design and construction, and Mahim Perez was in charge of the uh, material choosing and body construction. For the bodywork, uh, when designing the bodywork, the main objective uh, to be achieved were uh, to design an aerodynamic body to have a low drag coefficient, uh, to make a flow simulation on a <coughs> solid work model to test it and to see how it was, and to build the body using a strong and light materials. Um, we made three different designs in solid work, and we made a flow simulation on each one to find the drag coefficient. And after that, we, dis uh, we decided that our best option was the, the option number three, which is this one, which has the, the shape of the bullet. Uh, we chose this one. We chose this one because it has the, the lowest drag coefficient, and it was the most more, more comfortable for the driver. Uh, after that, uh, we have the idea of have a unibody chassis car, so we can remove uh, weight from the car. Uh, so for this, we, need, we needed a body uh, light, aerodynamic, and strong enough to support all the load uh, that needs to support. Um, we also made a more realistic model on SOLIDWORK, and we showed uh, for building material uh, a compound of Kevlar and carbon fiber and a divine cell foam. Put them together as a sandwich. Uh, we, we, we put uh, two layers of the Kevlar com uh, fi carbon fiber and the divine cell foam in the middle as a core material. <coughs> and we reinforce on a special part on the car, like the rover, with an extra layer, and here, where the wheels, wheels are attached. After that, we, uh, we, we also designed uh, where to cut the, the, the windshield and the side windows, and the two doors for the driver and the, all, all the components on the back. Uh, we also designed a ventilation system in the car. Uh, this vents in the floor for, to, uh, as an inlet for the air and two vents in the side, which you can see here, and the other side, uh, as an outlet for the air. Uh, this is the moment where, in the competition, where, where they weighed the car. Uh, the weight of the car was 50 kilograms, it's around 110 pounds. Hi, ladies and gentlemen, I'm here to talk a little bit about the material selection and the construction of the actual car, the body of the car. For the material selection, we went with the carbon Kevlar fiber, which has a lower density. It has an increased toughness, flexibility, and abrasion resistance, um, and it's a lower cost than the actual carbon fiber. We went also, uh, lower density means a, a, a less weight of the car. So for the reinforcements of the roll bar and of the, the steering system, we went with the, with the carbon fiber, uh, traditional carbon fiber, because it has a, a high elastic modulus. It has 70% lighter than steel, 40% uh, lighter than, than aluminum, a high strength to weight ratio, high corrosion resistance, and uh, the application flexibility is great, and it has a low mass. 
Uh, we tested the, the floor using a, um, a compression tester. Uh, here's, here's a chart. Uh, here you can see the load pound force uh, and against the deflection. The floor sample failed at about 125 pound force, which was uh, for, for, for the driver and the weight of the, the components. Uh, the, for the construction process, um, we had a couple of alternatives. We could have used a, pl a plug or a mold. A mold simply is used several times to make uh, more than one car. So we went with a plug because we're only making one car. We had um, the option of also distributing the resin through the fiber using vacuum infusion or laying. We chose laying um, just because of uh, cost constraints. For the stage one of the construction, we, we went ahead and cut uh, a cross section of the floor. Um, set up uh, set up our, our to set up our skeleton. We we we. Uh, we cut cross sections of styrofoam, placed them strategically along the, the floor um, design, and um, filled it with uh, insulation foam and styrofoam, and then sanded it down as much as we could to get it as nice and smooth as possible. For the stage two of the construction, we placed body filler to fill in every gap uh, in the styrofoam that we had, sanded it down nicely until we had a nice uh, clean uh, uh, plug, um, and then we placed primer on it. Um, here you can see uh, we're placing the primer. That's um, some putty, and uh, um, yeah. And then we placed wax on it, uh, a mold release wax. So when we put the fiber on it, it would release uh, from the from the actual plug nicely. For the stage three construction, uh, we went ahead and, and put the layers of uh, carbon Kevlar. We put one uh, layer of carbon Kevlar first, lay it on there with the resin, wait till it dry. Then we used a core material, the beginning cell H. Uh, it has this high strength to weight uh, density ratio. Uh, it has really good compressive strength and shear property. And it makes it ideal, the uh, duct top qualities make it ideal for, for fatigue, slamming, and impact loads. Uh, we placed the core material completely on top of the, the layer of, carb, of carbon Kevlar. And then continued to put another layer of carbon Kevlar on top. Um, always using safety goggles and gloves, uh, we, we went ahead and laid the, the resin on it. Flatten it ni nice and, and, and good to flatten all the crevices and make it nice and smooth. For the windshield, we used 1 8 thick uh, plexiglass. Uh, we placed it in, in an oven uh, to 253 Fahrenheit until it became malleable. Uh, we, we were trying to do a whole uh, one, one structure of plexiglass. We ended up doing two uh, just because of complications with the, with the malleableness of the, of the plexiglass. And then we attached them using silicone. For the power chain, Javier's going to talk to you guys. All right. So, all right, so the main objective for our power chain and energy, ma energy management system was pretty much how, how are we going to transfer the power from the energy source onto the drivetrain and propel the vehicle forward. So we had a proposal to uh, implement an electrical motor. Uh, in order to save our consumptions, uh, we, we adapted a uh, manual override of the secondary kill switch that the driver would uh, implement while coasting, which, reduced, which cut the, the energy consumption and have the, uh, the motor controller help distribute the energy from the energy source, which is the battery, onto the motor and to the, and to the throttles. So our propulsion system incorporated a 36 volt, 500 watt brushless motor. Uh, it was uh, one of the best choices that we had due to a uh, size limitation and light, lightness. Um, weight capacity on that motor was 300 pounds with a max uh, speed of approximately 23 miles per hour. Uh, that also came with the motor controller, which, as stated before, helped distribute the energy from the battery onto the, to the motor and different components such as the throttle. All right, so for the manufacturing, uh, pretty much we fabricated two uh, custom uh, aluminum brackets on, on each side of the rear mount. Um, with the help of Luis uh, Rojas, uh, he helped us uh, weld on uh, different ribs in order to, uh, to, uh, to, to reinforce the structure of, of the brackets. So uh, we, we customized two vertical channels to make it uh, easily accessible uh, with any alignment to the, for the rear wheel or any uh, adjustments to the rear brake. All right, so uh, another inspection that we, have to, we also had to pass was uh, the visibility and the horn test. So pretty much um, the driver had to sit within the car uh, enclosed and had to have a, a range of 180 degrees and, and make sure to identify each, each of the pylons. Uh, besides that, we had a, a decibel reader four meters out, and our horn had to surpass uh, 85 uh, decibels. Uh, it's just to ensure that while we're passing on the track, that each driver can hear us. Uh, on top of that, another another important inspection was the seatbelt. Pretty much, they, what what they reinforced was uh, making sure that all the mounts and the harnesses were uh, safely and securely uh, bolted onto the to the vehicle, and uh, having ergonomic uh, comfort uh, for the driver. So we had to customize it for the driver. 
Um, they tested out the, the structure of the seatbelt harness by applying a load, lifting actually, like having the, the driver onto the vehicle, lifting it up by the buckle, and exposing it to a 75 newton's force, which actually lifted the car. And then at the same time, they also inspected the roll bar, making sure that it could take uh, the 700 newtons. All right, on the next test, you can see that uh, it was an emergency test. So pretty much what they're looking for is to make sure that the driver is uh, capable of getting out of the vehicle within 10 seconds. This is very important. Uh, in case of there's a, there's a car accident or there's a, most important, a fire, uh, as you can see, she's accelerating. She got in, I believe, 7.4 seconds, so it was more than that. And uh, it's just to, to, to verify that the, that, the, that the driver and the vehicle are compatible. All right, so for the standards, we had lots of regulations and standards that we had to comply by just by the Shelly Marathon competition by itself. Anywhere between wheelbases to, to weight to how exactly we have to, we have to, um, we have to wire up our schematics with the drill meter, all of that we had to comply with the Shelly Marathon because if we didn't pass inspection, we wouldn't be able to race. Uh, on top of that, as we went along with the construction, uh, we abided by SAE standards, ANSYS, and uh, ASME standards as, uh, as uh, making sure that all our structural loading is correct, our analysis and our construction, and also complying with the code of ethics. All right, so once we go to the competition, there's lots of recommendations that you can see. You get exposed to different uh, teams, you get to different ideas. Some teams have gone there for 30 years. Uh, sorry, yeah, for about 30 years it's been running, and some, there's some teams that have gone like 10 years in a row. So what we saw, the main thing that we can improve upon is actually implementing a larger uh, windshield. Uh, it, makes, it makes it easier for the, for the driver exit. You can just kick it off, come out easier, and it improves the visibility. Uh, on top of that, it doesn't limit the restriction of the driver's height. Uh, we, we do want the lighter driver, but if you have a taller driver that's lighter, it won't limit uh, the size within the cockpit. Uh, another design that we also saw was uh, some, some teams implemented joystick designs. Uh, in order to turn the wheels. Uh, we thought that was actually pretty innovating uh, just because uh, it, it, it increases the space